please give a warm welcome to the hosts of Alternate Ending. Welcome to Alternate Ending, where we're discovering good movies, one bad movie at a time. And today in our interview series, I am so delighted to introduce you to today's guest, Dr. Uva Boll. You know him from House of the Dead, Blood Rain, Alone in the Dark, Postal, my personal favorite, Tunnel Rats. And after a hiatus from the film industry, he is gearing up for the release of his newest film, First Shift. Dr. Boll, how are you doing today? I'm very good. I'm in Germany and it's uh, slowly getting evening time. Yeah, it's good. Excellent. Good to hear it. Um, so I want to start off with something that you and I have in common, which is that we actually both have doctoral degrees in literature. And then oh, you went in a somewhat different route from that, obviously. Can you tell me a little bit about how, if at all, your expertise in literature has influenced your filmmaking and your film career and uh, how that got you started on your current path? I mean, what, what definitely is a big uh, point in reading a lot uh, is this kind of, you learn in books, I think, uh, even deeper, the, the kind of storytelling, what keeps people interested, you know? So, I mean, in the film, you have two hours, a book you read over days or weeks, it depends how big the book is. It's, of course, a different kind of storytelling. But I think the love for stories in general comes from books. And then film comes after, you know, so, uh, and I think it, it helped also um, to, to, to get this mindset, like what is behind a film, you know, like I have, uh, I did a lot of like existentialistic films, kind of like going to really deep about life and death. And I think that of course comes also from the literature I, I read when I was at university. Very good. So um, films, yeah, films do speak to all of us, I think, almost as a kind of literature, a different kind of literature that exists in front of our eyes and not necessarily on the page. And it's a thing that I'm always telling my students now is that uh, it's a little bit pointless to compare books to movies and adaptation because it's a completely different sort of medium. On the other hand, the film is a much closer medium, at least in its style, to the video game. So what drew you to your career in video game adaptation? Uh, I should say money. No, it, it was this kind of, I just did a film, Heart of America. And uh, for example, Elizabeth Moss played in it. She's mm -hmm. now a big star with Handmaid's Tale and all that other shows. Um, and it was about school violence. And I think it's a very good drama, uh, but it didn't make any money, you know? So you get two good reviews and uh, then the sales are a disaster. And then I got approached from a production company who basically owned the rights to Zega's House of the Dead. And that is why I did the film. And then besides bad reviews, the film made a lot of money. So, um, and this in a way uh, was leading them to Alone in the Dark, Blood Rain, Dungeon Siege, Far Cry, Postal, a lot of video game uh, films. And uh, I think it's almost funny to see now with Mario Brothers, whatever, and everybody jumps now back on video game based films and they say it's uh, the new comic books of the new generation. I think we said that 20 years ago and even before me was, was uh, uh, Wing Commander and some other uh, adaptation. So it was never, uh, it, but it, it is a genre what didn't get the credit as comic book films got. And it also didn't get the money, to be honest, like what comic book films spending. Uh, the video game based films are normally medium range, like Resident Evil also, this kind of uh, uh, films, they don't get $200 million to make this kind of film. So it was this, um, you know, like the little uh, dark stepbrother of the comic book films. But I, of course, saw an opportunity at that point because video game companies also were approachable. You know, if I go now to Ubisoft and say, I want to do Far Cry again, they want $10, $10 million or something so that you even get a license to do it. And in this times, uh, when, when I started, video games were big, but they were not so big as now. And uh, like as a, as a separate market, basically. And I think mm -hmm. they also saw an opportunity to make the game more uh, famous based on the film uh, getting shot from from the game, you know. So, yeah. But I mean, film. You know, like film is 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 a commercial thing. And I always say that the the biggest mistake you can do is you make a boring film. 
And so, and I think even films I got not good reviews for were never boring, at least. And mm -hmm. a lot of people uh, <laughs> uh, still emailing about that films and say like, look, I love that, that film from you. So That's great. Um, so you took a bit of a hiatus from the film industry and now you're back. And to prepare for this, last night I actually watched your most recent released film, which was Hanau Deutschland im Winter. Did I get the title right? I keep mixing yes, up the totally I keep mixing right. up the words in the title. Um, but uh, so it's a very different creature from some of the ones that uh, you are, I guess, most famous for, in that it seems to be much more of like it's a very intimate character study of a character that probably. I mean, I, I think probably a lot of filmmakers just wouldn't have wanted to touch that with a 40 foot pole. So can you tell me a little bit about uh, about that project being kind of your first, I don't know about big thing, but your first real thing back from the hiatus and why it was important to you to make that project the way that you did? Yeah, it was basically, so we moved from Vancouver to uh, Germany, 2020, and that was the beginning of COVID. Everything was like shutting down. And I saw like, but I'd, I'd want to do something. And a very intimate, smaller film was maybe a possibility, even with COVID, with all the testing and all that stuff, you know, that you don't have too many people in a shot together. And, and uh, so it was kind of like, um, that was one of the reasons to, to do a very small thing. But on the other hand, Hanau is 30 kilometers away from where I live. And it was very, uh, let's say, uh, uh, touched by what happened there, because we had a a combination out of a total crazy conspiracy guy who basically went down the rabbit hole and lost completely control and then killed nine people, then his mother and himself. And I felt there were a few things that are worse to tell in a feature film. A, this kind of mindset, because he left this long, uh, yeah, like, like, crazy letter like what we, what what he's reading for us in the film right so where you feel like because he for example claimed he uh, uh, uh developed prison break and basic instinct that was his ideas and stuff in his uh, in his pamphlet what he basically wrote is a, is crystal clear a visible sign that he was mental ill and so and he went various times to the police and told the police the cia is on me i'm chipped and they still never took his weapons away. And that is the thing what was a huge discussion in Germany and the same discussion we have in the US a lot is this kind of like, why the law enforcement is not trying to basically stop people before they run amok and look, look deeper into, for example, the psychological mindset. A guy who runs various times to the police station and claims, uh, like whatever he's an agent or he gets observated, uh, shouldn't have a check, you know, like where they see, like, because if he wouldn't have guns, this was not a personality who attacks people with a knife or something. So without the, the, the guns, that other people would be still alive. And, uh, and I felt that was interesting, uh, especially when you see and you saw the film, he never saw the police the whole night, right? He went to two different locations, then he went home, killed his mother, killed himself. For him, it was kind of a clean uh, uh, acting without ever getting confronted by the police. And a lot of people there say also the police completely failed in acting. You know, like they didn't, they didn't uh, track him down before he was dead, basically. And uh, of course, the police got sued by all the survivors and the families uh, that is still pending, uh, pending in court. So, but I felt like I'm, I'm interested in this kind of subject matters because I did various films about people running amok. Like Rampage is way more entertaining in a way as uh, as Arnold. Uh, so, but that was the reason um, to do this. And uh, now I just came from New York where I shot a real film. Let's say it this way with, with, with first shift. So uh, now where it's easier to, to get things together and, and shoot films, I wanna make more the films I did before. Yeah. Okay, there's a scene early in Hanau where um, the, uh, where um, Tobias R, I guess is what you called him throughout yeah. that, is shaving his face and talking to himself in the mirror. And I was struck when I was watching that scene by how much it reminded me of an early scene from um, Henry Portrait of Serial Killer, where Michael Rooker is looking in the mirror 
as Henry. And it's famous for just the expression that he gives himself in the mirror. It's almost a completely dialogue free scene. This one, of course, is not a dialogue free scene, but it had, I thought, kind of a similar effect in knowing the character because it's really just the character all by himself thinking, of course, because he's a character that nobody is there and that he can be vulnerable with you and with himself in that moment. Um, and it, uh, it was a very moving scene to me. And I felt like I really understood where you were going with the character just from that scene early on. So I know you said just now that you're kind of returning to, uh, to the old style, to the more entertaining style. Um, but I guess from making this much more intimate, COVID-friendly, psychological movie, um, did you learn some things that you're going to be incorporating into your filmmaking in the future, even as you return to, uh, to, bigger, more, uh, to bigger extravaganzas of filmmaking? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I spent more time on the shots and it, there was a homage to Henry Porter with serial killer. There was like when I was young, Henry and, and Man Eats Dog, like Man Bites Dog. There was two films that very, very had an impact on me. And uh, I felt that it's good that you tell me what you felt watching it because if that scene would be 20 seconds long, it would have no impact. The impact comes that you see the whole shaving thing in real time. And uh, I felt a similar scene is when he is after he shoots everybody in the car and looks himself in the mirror and thinks, oh, I have blood, like, you know how I'm looking like a pig. So He's got a little he, dot of blood on his forehead. Blood, right? So he cleans himself before he goes inside the house. And I think also this kind of scenes are very important. Um, I think what I learned in, in first shift is that it's not, only like a cop thriller or whatever it's also a drama so i put um a lot of like emotions in it when i've wrote it already that it's not just like a uh, harsh police work it's also this kind of uh what happens to the people doing this and uh yeah and that is definitely what what i i think developed in a way as a filmmaker um and i want I will not copy the films I did before, you know, but it has also to do, I think, with the time we're living in now, you know, like, first of all, I did for four or five years, no film. Then uh, we had the COVID time. Now we have a very unsafe time. The first time I feel, you know, with the Ukraine war, you don't know if China attacks Taiwan. So we have this kind of like uh, enough craziness in the world around us that I want to bring up also a little more uh, the human side of society and and not be not necessarily so nihilistic as as i was with a lot of films uh, i did you know but i think when i did rampage one that was 2009 or, or something like this there it fit to put like the mirror in front of society in a very cold way you know i i felt like uh the, always when I, I always criticize the people with power or the bankers in the southern wall street you know this kind of greed and so on i think there it fit but also i think it has to uh the times were hard enough now i think we need a little hope in a in a film too so and and first shift definitely uh is a hard film it's a sad film but it's also a film full of hope what is i think important that's wonderful um, so a question that I like to pose to just filmmakers in general is a little fantasy. You have any budget you want. You can work with any actors you want, shoot in any location you want. What kind of film do you make? <laughs> That's a good point. So uh, uh, I, I, I like genre films in general. So I, I, I like uh, a thriller and action. Uh, I like war films. So it's, it's tough to uh, basically put something like out of the blue together. Uh, I'm definitely not a Marvel, you know, like it's not like, oh, I want 300 million and, and do like a crazy science fiction, a superhero film that I'm not interested in it. Um, but uh, I, I would like to make a bigger film, a bigger crime thriller, for example, like The Godfather and, and stuff like this in this style. I like this kind of films and I'm missing this kind of films. Like uh, take Heat, for example, from Michael Mann, right? So with, with De Niro and Pacino. Films like this don't exist anymore. And I feel like uh, I love this kind of films and I would, I would like to make a film like that. 
That sounds great. Um, so I know we probably are coming to the end of our time here, but for first oh, shift, okay. I have 10 more minutes if you want, it's all good. Oh, fabulous. In that case, let's go ahead and use them. So let's talk a little bit about first shift. So, um, Give me a little bit of what is First Shift about? What is ins What were your inspirations for making this movie? Why is this your return to the big screen? So it was, first of all, I liked my shootings in uh, Southern Wall Street in New York. I shot also an advertising spot there and parts of uh, Alone in the Dark 2. What I produced was, was shot there. So, and I liked the, the scenery in New York. And I felt like uh, if you do a cop thriller, let's do Brooklyn. You know, so where uh, a lot of uh, police work is, is every day there, there's a lot of crime. And, uh, but I felt, so I have to do like a guy basically, so my lead actor, uh, Gino Pizzi pay, uh, plays him and uh, he's working alone. So he doesn't have a partner. And at, at that specific day, he gets a new partner. It's Kristen Rented, what we know from like Sons of Anarchy and things like this. So she uh, comes in full of motivation, and he doesn't want her. So we have the classical, this kind of lethal weapon situation in a way, you know, where they, they uh, he doesn't want her. So they have this kind of rivalry and, and problems in the beginning, but then they're getting drawn into the problems of the actual work and getting in some dangerous situations where they're depending on each other. And uh, so they turn it into, they turn into friends that day, but they also, for example, have to rescue a dog and then they don't bring the dog to the shelter. They bring the dog to the shelter, but then they don't, they cannot do it. So they have the dog in the car the whole day and uh, have to explain uh, the, the captain also like, why is the dog in your car? So stuff like this. So I mix it up with humor, you know, and it's kind of, we have also a side plot with the mafia where we had like um, De uh, Daniel Soli, for example, he was the, oh, sorry about that hang up oh, okay. so she, she was the uh um, he he was the bad guy in uh, the juice that tv show with james franco and uh i uh um, i'm sorry about that i don't know what i'm doing here that is my phone <laughs> i can't i don't know how to stop it so I hope somebody speaks on my answer machine. So, and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and this is the thing where, where um, there are side plots with like mafia killings and stuff like this. They're very action driven, you know, and then you have this main plot between the actors who basically uh, driving through the whole city. So we shot in Queens, Long Island, Staten Island, in, the, in, in uh, Brooklyn and in Manhattan. So, uh, and it's just a film I wrote in a way, I would watch this, you know, I would like to, to watch this, you know, and I felt like if I shoot the film like an independent film, I hope to get in some film festivals I, uh, and, and maybe we get a little theatrical release, that would be great, you know, so that is the idea. I'm not the big fan of, I mean, I, of course, we all watch the streamers. But I still like to have a DVD of a film. I still like to have a film on screen from time to time uh, and not just boom. And one week later, you're gone. You know, yeah, that's, that's a problem. And also because it. it doesn't really exist unless you can hold it in your hand is kind of my feeling on the matter. Yes. You know, and I like the making of, uh, we shot the making of, I would do a director's commentary and stuff like this. And I think that that makes a film alive. And also, uh, for example, when I see... Um, how many times my films are still getting aired in cable and whatsoever uh, in, in TV around the world uh, that would not happen uh, years and years later without the theatrical releases before or without the, that people have the DVD and the, and the Blu-ray. Yeah, that all makes perfect sense to me. Um, so... Final question for you. So you wear a lot of hats when it comes to filmmaking. So you're a director, you're a writer, you're sometimes a producer, sometimes you're even in front of the camera as you were with Hanal. Um, if you could only do one of those for the rest of your career, if you could only wear one of those hats, which one of those is your favorite to wear at this point in your career? Directing. So I love working with the actors and the rest is the work to come to this. 
you know, the producing and writing and whatever uh, is is uh, the hard work you uh, that you finally there on set with the actors and you can uh, do the film. And I enjoy that a lot. I know a lot of directors, they have the feeling, oh, the actor's destroying my vision. You know, like stuff like this. Kubrick always said that, right? So that he he had it in an ideal way written and then the actor's coming in and you see it's different to what you had in your head. I'm not like this. I, I like it that it's changing also based on the actors and on the characters. And I, I let them do their takes also where they just offer me how to play the scene, how they want to play the scene. And a lot of times um, they're making good decisions. You know, you may, sometimes you have to change a little, wh whatever, and you say, no, I don't see this. And But um, overall, I think if they have the creativity and the freedom, they are more motivated also to bring that extra mile uh, uh, to a film. I think that is very, very important. So you are not anticipating the supposedly upcoming age of completely computer generated actors whom you can order to do whatever you want, because there does need to be that human element to the action where it's two creative people working together, not just one creative person telling everybody what to do. Yeah, that is then my final retirement. And I even I have to say, when I just watched the new Avatar film, right, I felt like I could never shoot that before I shoot a film. It's of course, it's like sensational. But I could never be like six years in a water tank or in front of green screen, you know, and get a day one little shot done because it's so complicated with the 3D technology and what they're doing. I mean, I admire it that Cameron is like a more a technician almost as a as a director that, you know, he always is looking for the new uh, uh, visual uh, like sensational uh, development. But I'm not like this. I'm more story driven. I just want to tell a story. And I love working with people and not with, also not with CGI. I always, when we shot in the studio, on Alone in the Dark, we shot some stuff in the studio or in the name of the king. I like more to shoot on real locations in general. And I'm so happy to be in the forest shooting something as in front, in, in, a, in a dark studio. And so Avatar, if they would say, oh, Avatar 3, six years of shooting, uh, I would I would have to pass, even if I would know, oh, my God, I could uh, have a huge success. But I, I couldn't do it. I, I know I would, like, get very depressed sitting at the pool every day, looking down and see the green screen divers. Yeah. <laughs> it's one way of working. It's not your way of working. And isn't it wonderful that we live in a world where there's room for both Avatar and also movies like Get Hanau, First Shift, Blood Rain, things like that. Dr. Totally. Bull, thank you so much. For I, I, loved, I, I loved Avatar, right? I, yeah. I think it was uh, uh, enormously entertaining and I was a little scared that it's not. You know, I was a little scared that it's the same thing like the first part. But it I have was the same not, concern. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so and I was not bored in that three hours, and of course blown away about the technical uh, uh, value what they what they brought to the screen. What what was really a step way further as Avengers and all the the other films. I mean, uh, he did it again. You can you can say you know so. But look, uh, I I am as you said, it's like there are films for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. This has been a lot of fun. The film coming out is First Shift. In the meantime, you know where to find the rest of Dr. Bull's filmography. Um, I wish you the best of luck with uh, the rest of your work. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good night. Bye. I can hang up, right? Without. Uh... Yes, you can. Okay, very good. Okay, bye bye. All right. Bye bye.